Scotland Bill Committee. Now. 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 Order. <laughs> Order. Scotland. We begin with Amendment 16 to Clause 1, with which it will be convenient to debate Amendments 37, 17, 58, 38, 18 and 59 to Clause 1. That Clause 1 stand part of the Bill and Audit 89. New Clauses 2, 3, 6, 7, 8 and 9 and Amendments 1 and 2. Mr Alistair Carmichael to move Amendment Good afternoon and welcome you to the chair of our proceedings this afternoon. I beg to move that uh, amendments 16, 17 and 18 standing in my name be made. Uh, I should explain to the House, uh, Mr Hoyle, that these are essentially probing amendments. They were authored, in fact, by the Law Society of Scotland and subject to the response that we hear from the Treasury bench and indeed from other parts of the House. It's not currently my intention to seek to divide the House in relation to them. Um, The effect of these amendments is to change the uh, nature of the the Clause uh, clause 1 from one which recognises the permanence of the Scottish Parliament to one which declares it. Uh, The genesis of the whole clause, in fact, was in the Smith Commission report itself, which required that there should be a statement in the legislation to follow that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government were permanent institutions. Now, the form of words that currently appears in Clause 1 was the form of words that was uh, inserted in the uh, draft clauses that were published at the end of January. They recognised the permanence. The reason for that was, in fact, and I will return to this point in a few minutes, I think that the permanence of the Scottish Parliament is to be found not in uh, any amendment or not any in statutory act- enactment, but in fact in the will of the Scottish people. It, they are permanent. It is a permanent institution because it is frankly unthinkable that it would be uh, repealed at this point. Um, it is for that reason, uh, and given the comments of the Scottish Parliament's Devolution Further Powers Committee, that I think it's right that we should revisit this issue today. But at the heart of this debate, the uh, issue and the definition of sovereignty is essentially to be found. The context is, of course, a classic Dicean definition of sovereignty, which says that Parliament here is sovereign. Uh, Although, in fact, uh, Mr Hoyle, matters have moved on somewhat over the years, and although it it remains the case that Parliament cannot bind its successors. It is undoubtedly the fact that since the European Communities Act of 1972, we have undertaken a different view of parliamentary sovereignty, one in which sovereignty is shared uh, with the European Union, as it now is in Brussels, with the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Ireland Assembly, and indeed even the London uh, Assembly. It was something which was the subject of considerable debate uh, during the course of the Constitutional Convention back in the late 80s and early 1990s. And the view that was taken then, which as I recall was actually contained within the claim of right, was that in Scotland uh, the Dicean version of of sovereignty, that Parliament is sovereign, Uh, has never actually been the case and that sovereignty has always been vested in and remained with the people of Scotland. From that point of view, I actually do see some considerable merit in amendment number 58, which stands in the name of the Honourable Member for Murray and and his uh, colleagues in the Scottish National Party, requiring that if there were ever to be a repeal of the Scotland Act, that it could only be done with the consent of the majority voting in a referendum. I think that is something which does honour and and respect the view that uh, sovereignty lies with the the people in Scotland. The fact of the matter is, though, that even that clause is something which could still be got around by a simple repeal, the the doctrine, a consequence of the doctrine that Parliament cannot bind its successors. And essentially, I would suggest to the House, Mr Hoyle, that for as long as we try to do these things by way of primary legislation, 
then we are going to keep tying ourselves up in knots and that any solution that we bring forward is going to be one which will lack permanence, will essentially be unsatisfactory. I'll give way to the Honourable Member. Uh, I don't know if the Honourable Member can recall uh, the uh, former member for Monklands, I believe, and uh, leader of the Labour Party, John Smith, who said the British Constitution, in which embraces the Scottish Constitution, uh, should not be a matter of judicial archaeology, was the phrase he used, but should actually be written down plainly in a written constitution for all to see. Is that where his argument is going? I hope it is. That is a view that I have uh, long held. In fact, I can't remember a time in my conscious political being where I have held a view other than that. Uh, It's never going to be easy to get to that point, of course, uh, and it will require a quite fundamental change in the way we do things. And uh, the reference to judicial archaeology is an interesting one because, of course, it would render some of the things that were done in this place uh, reviewable in the courts. Now, uh, given that, or as long as you have a proper separation of powers, then I personally am quite happy with that. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The Honourable Gentleman giving way. I hear what he says about uh, uh, Amendment 58, uh, and he's of course correct that the, the Parliament can't bind the successor. But if we put into this Act that there has to be a referendum of the Scottish people before there can be a change, that's a very powerful moral argument against this phrase and the strongest we can do in the current constitutional state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I- indeed, and it's for that reason that I said earlier on that I saw some merit in the proposal. He would have to accept, though, that the point that I've already made, that even that is something which could be repealed by a simple vote in in this chamber and the other place, uh, is something which uh, which, uh, will always be a problem for any government that is seeking to do this by way of primary legislation. Uh, Certainly. I beg for the Honourable Gentleman giving way. Would he accept that he, uh, or does he share my hope that the English members here will approach this change to give Scotland stability, in that some of us hope very much that we will be discussing the English question uh, later this poem, and we will be asking Scottish members to actually give us a similar uh, stability that we seek to give them. Uh, I do actually uh, agree with the Right Honourable Gentleman on that point, uh, and indeed... I see the bill in which we are engaged in debating today as being a start of a process that must continue in the course of this, because otherwise we do risk putting a strain, an intolerable strain in the Union if we proceed only with uh, changes to the Constitution as it relates to Scotland and not to the rest of the United Kingdom, in particular uh, in relation to the different parts of England. Now, uh, I... The only point in which I am clear, as far as as the future of the English Constitution is concerned, is that there is absolutely no consensus uh, around the the shape that it ought to take. Uh, I stood at the dispatch box in the last Parliament, often enough answering questions from both sides of the House, being being told that this was what was wanted, uh, and you rarely heard the same same, uh, proposition twice. It's for that reason, in fact, that if we are to have a written constitution, then we must first of all have a constitutional convention, because you will never build the, the, the consensus that is necessary for constitutional change of this sort merely within Parliament. Uh, that was the experience in Scotland, that was how we learned to do things through the constitutional convention in the 1990s, it was then the lesson of the uh, Smith Commission and uh, before that, the Kalman Commission. I'll give away. In a way, but um, while he ra- poses those doubts, does he not accept that given that we're now on this process of changing our constitution and of meeting the wishes of the Scottish people, we won't probably in England have to wait so long for opinion to come together on what England needs as the pioneers have had to wait to get justice for Scotland. Well, uh, I, I, I'm heartened by the Right Honourable Gentleman's optimism uh, in this part. 
Uh, I always think that, uh, uh, that, that uh, achieving consensus in these things is much easier to talk about than to achieve. But frankly, this is a debate that England needs to have for herself now. It's not something, any more than we would have welcomed the intervention of the English Welsh or Northern Irish in the Constitutional Convention discussions in the, in the 1990s, any more that it's, it's certainly not for us to, to intervene in that debate, and I wish the English every bit as much joy with it as we have had in Scotland with our constitutional debate over the years. Um, but the Honourable Member from Edinburgh South has brought forward uh, an amendment in relation to the uh, constitution of a constitutional convention, um, and I think there is a great deal in that which I would find worthy of support, and particularly taken with the fact that it is required to be um, convened within a month of the passing of this bill for it becoming an act. So I don't think that these are matters which become any easier for being left. I'm also impressed by the fact that it has a reporting date which would, would serve to concentrate minds, uh, I would suggest. It has the further uh, benefit, speaking as a Scottish member, in that it would allow a constitutional convention to go ahead. It, we would say today that this was something that was going to happen but it would not, in fact, delay the passing of the bill which is before the House today. I think for us to uh, hold faith with the 55% of the people of Scotland who voted no last September, it's important that we do proceed with this bill with all due dispatch. Uh, and I don't think it would be acceptable if the passing of this bill were somehow to be contingent on constitutional arrangements being refined elsewhere in the United Kingdom. For my part, and I think inevitably so, I, I, it's just in a second, uh, I, I would have preferred to see included within the remit of that constitutional convention uh, the question of electoral reform, something for which I know there is now greater support within the Labour Party itself, but uh, I wouldn't uh, let that uh, omission stand between me and support of it today. I give way to the Honourable Member. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to him, and I want to congratulate him on the case that he's making in his usual eloquent and, uh, and, and persuasive way. And I want to tell him that lots of people on both sides of the House, I think, will, wel uh, will welcome the fact that he's here and want to express our support for him and tell him how, how, how much we hope that he is successful in standing up to the people sitting in front of him who clearly want to create a one-party state in Scotland yeah. and whose supporters... And whose supporters... Yeah. 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 And whose supporters and whose supporters engage in the most disreputable bullying tactics to silence any dissent in that country. Silly boy. I, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman for his support. Silly These days boy. I'll take support anywhere I can find it. I, I, I'm, not in, I'm not entirely sure that his remarks are germane to the, the matter before the House, however. Um, so I will uh, simply leave it at that Silly point. Boy. Um, there, are, there is one other uh, matter which is before the House in this string of amendments, Mr Hoyle, <laughs> and that is the amendment from the Scottish National Party, amendment number 89, which will uh, facilitate a debate on the concept of full fiscal autonomy. Um, I shall listen with interest to the Honourable Member for Murray and others uh, in their exposition of this, and I shall reserve my remarks in relation to that uh, until the point at which I know I will be able to catch your eye at the end of this string. Okay.